All right. Um, as you know, we do record these meetings to put on the church's website, but um, it doesn't show your name or anything, and um, there's no contact information involved or anything like that. But I think you can also deny it if something pops up. I think you can deny if you want it to be recorded or something like that. But nothing confidential is shared at all, so you don't have to worry about that. And tonight's speaker is actually Shakira Ford, a really good friend of mine. I think we met um, during hurricane, actually. Um, she was helping out at the school I teach at, and she was giving up her time to help other people. And we got connected, and immediately we started this friendship because we're very passionate about the same things, um, especially about preparing for Jesus' second coming. And she has spent hours of research on doctrine, on prophecy, on health, and especially on fasting and prayer. Um, she was actually the one that inspired me to do the study on prayer because she's made such an influence on my life. So before we begin, if Mark, another good friend, a prayer warrior of mine, if you don't mind praying, and then we're going to get started because Shakira has a lot to share. All right, then let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us, fill us with your love and your spirit. Be with Shakira as she uh, speaks to us about fasting and prayer. And I, I know, Lord, that we have a blessing. So I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds. May we not be bigoted for anything that we don't like. <laughs> I don't like fast. But Lord, just thank you very much that we have this opportunity. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Shakira. I, I think you could just hit the share screen on the bottom and hopefully everything will pop up. Okay. So... Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I Good. can see it on my end. Yeah. Good. Okay. So can you see, um, I have something else showing like the presenter view. Can you see that? Um, no. no, all we see is okay. the slide the itself. Slide. Is great. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. That's perfect. So um, thank you everyone for joining. I'll just go ahead and get started um, just to respect everyone's time. So the conversation or the topic is about um, prayer and fasting which I know can be a very challenging subject for many of us. So I'm hoping that through this, it's an educational um, educational time for us and that we're able to learn and, you know, just ask God to open our hearts if there's anything that we need to um, incorporate more into our life. And if we're already fasting and praying, just anything else that we need to do to have a more positive spirit-filled experience. So... Um, this first slide and the first couple of slides um, are just really informational. Um, they're key points and practical pointers for biblical fasting. And I compiled a lot of this information from Melody Mason. Um, this, these, the first couple of slides, she's an Adventist author and she's the one that um, Ashley's referred to in the book, Daring to Ask for More. So she mm. has a lot of knowledge. She, I know she works for the general conference and she has a lot of knowledge and experience in prayer. And I find the information that she's compiled to be very, um, just very practical. So the first thing is to just define and understand what fasting is. So from a medical, I guess, or even like the dictionary definition, we would consider fasting to be, um, to eat very little or I'm sorry, to abstain from or eat very little food and or drink for a specified period of time as a religious or health discipline. So like I said, fasting can be, um, you know, something that someone does for their health for a medical reason to fast before a doctor's appointment. It's not necessarily something that's done for religious reasons or health or um, spiritual reasons. But what we're mainly going to focus on is the fasting that is done for spiritual purposes. So in that context, um, fasting would be a time of heart evaluation as the petitioner seeks God's blessing or deliverance in some situation. And we're going to talk about reasons, additional reasons for fasting as well, since um, blessing or deliverance are, are kind of just a couple of the many reasons why people fast. So fasting from food should be combined with extra time in the word and seeking God in prayer. And if we actually look at Matthew 6, um, Jesus is continuing the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about, um, he gives different instructions. And the first one is, you know, when you do your alms, not to do them before men. And then he, he goes on to prayer. And then right after prayer, he goes in verse 16 and 17, um, is like the intro to fasting, the intro to um, his instruction on fasting. And that 
the fact that he goes directly from prayer to fasting really helps to solidify the fact that prayer and fasting are combined. If we're going to be fasting for spiritual reasons, then we should be combining that with prayer. It should not just be abstinence from food, because if it's just abstaining from food, it's, it's more like a diet and it's not really actually like prayer and fasting as it should be. Um, and then I wanted to highlight specifically Leviticus 16, 29, because Leviticus 16 is where God is instructing the children, is instructing Moses on the day of atonement. And I'm not going to go too deep into prophecy or um, those aspects of, of um, this chapter, but the day of atonement was the one day of the year that the high priest would go into the most holy place to officiate. Um, the sanctuary service year round for the other 359 days took place in the between the courtyard, the outer court and the holy place. And then the one day, the last day of their year, um, the high priest would go into the most holy place to officiate. And this instruction in verse 29 is where God was telling Moses exactly what should be what that day should consist of. So God told Moses, I'm going to just point out the part that's underlined that they should afflict their souls. And if anyone wants to answer, um, what does it mean to afflict your soul? Well, it's fasting and prayer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I went forward a slide by accident. A couple. Okay. So, um, just to kind of give additional context to the word of afflict, um, the Hebrew word ana is also used in the context of humble. And when you cross-reference Deuteronomy 8.3 with this verse, Leviticus 16.29, um, Deuteronomy 8.3 actually uses the word humble, and it's the same Hebrew word that's used um, in this verse, Leviticus 16.29, to mean afflict. So humbling your soul is equivalent to confession of sin and putting away wrongs between you and um, anyone else who's around you. So it was a time for afflicting their souls. It was a time for, um, as Elder Mark said, prayer and fasting. It wasn't just a time where they were gathered around the courtyard, hoping the high priest came out. Um, they were spending time putting away wrongs. They were spending time praying. They were spending time evaluating their heart, making sure they were right between themselves and God mm -hmm. and, um, and their fellow men. So considering the fact that we as Adventists understand that we're in the anti-typical day of atonement, Amen. we should be, we should be afflicting our souls during this period of time. So we should be um, humbling ourselves, evaluating our heart on a day, day by day basis, making sure we're right with God. We're right with those around us. We're offering confession for our sins and we're just putting away any wrongs. So I just wanted to highlight that verse since we are, um, we do understand that we're in the day of atonement and what that means for us from a, just a spiritual standpoint and a practical standpoint. Amen. So in Matthew 6, 6, 16, just continuing on from Matthew 6, Jesus went on when he was instructing the people and he told them, moreover, when you fast. So that helps us to understand that fasting is not optional, but it's given. Because a lot of times we treat fasting like it's optional. Um, it's something that we might do or, you know, maybe if I feel like it or whenever I get the chance, but it's a discipline that Jesus spoke about. So because he's our exa example and because, um, you know, we should live not by just physical food, but by the word of God, we yeah. have to understand that fasting is not just optional, but it's given. So he didn't even just say that one time. He actually said it twice. So in Matthew 6, 16, he said, moreover, when you fast, and then in verse 17, he went on again and he said, but thou, when thou fastest. So it was not an if, it was a when that he was instructing the people. Um, and fasting is also seen throughout the Bible. And I compiled a list of different books of the Bible where just the word fast or fasting or a variation of that word is mentioned. So it doesn't mean that fasting is not seen throughout other books of the Bible um, besides the one I have on the screen. It just means that that word was found in those books. But other books like um, Leviticus, like I mentioned, um, the afflicting of souls, um, it also mentions in Leviticus 16, 29 that they shouldn't do any work. So I would imagine that they weren't cooking, they weren't preparing food, they weren't worrying about those kinds of things 
while they were um, in the Day of Atonement. And so with that being said, um, even though the word fast is not seen in Leviticus 16, we can understand or um, believe that they were fasting during that time. Um, and then even John the Baptist, he taught fasting because in Mark 2, 18, his disciples approached um, Jesus and said, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast? So we can see that it was a practice that was continued from the Old Testament and it continued right on into the New Testament as well. So reasons for fasting. There's a lot of different reasons um, that fasting is practiced. And I just, this is not necessarily an um, exhaustive list. I just wanted to go through a few different reasons and their scriptural reference for fasting. So the first one is Daniel 10. Um, I think I have a typo that should probably be Daniel 10, 13 and maybe chapter 12. But in Daniel 10, um, he had been given information or um, information on what would happen to his people. Um, and in Daniel 9, he got that information. And in Daniel 10, he was fasting and he was trying to have a deeper understanding of what it was. And then we see that Gabriel actually came and he gave him understanding of the vision that he got in Daniel 10. So in a practical sense for us, um, we can use fasting as a tool of, in combination with scripture or studying scripture to have a deeper understanding and ask God for understanding of things that we may not understand in the scriptures. Um, we see that Jesus fasted at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4. Um, there was deliverance and seeking God's help in a crisis um, when Jehoshaphat, um, king of Judah, realized that there were foreign armies that were coming to fight against them in 2 Chronicles 20, he proclaimed a fast. Um, and then there was spiritual revival in Nehemiah when Nehemiah left, um, I think, the kingdom of Persia and went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, to repair the gate. Um, the people were reintroduced or introduced to the law. They had been in captivity for such a long time, but they were introduced to the law. They were reading the law, and that was a time of spiritual revival for them. And a fast was proclaimed for them to just afflict their souls, confess their sins, put away wrongs, and to just continue on with that that spiritual revival that they were having now that they were back in Jerusalem. Um, the Verses of Matthew 17, 21 and Mark 9, 9, those are, that's actually the same instance when Jesus casted out the demon that was in the boy that the father had taken to Jesus. And the disciples were embarrassed because they were unable to cast out the demon. And so they privately asked him, why couldn't we cast this demon out? And Jesus said specifically to them, um, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So we see that to have victory over demonic oppression, fasting is very important um, in order to do that. And in order to avert judgment, the king of Nineveh actually proclaimed a three-day, I'm sorry, it wasn't a three-day fast, but proclaimed a fast. And it was almost like a very extreme fast because judgment was being pronounced on Nineveh. Um, the destruction of Nineveh was, Nineveh was being pronounced. So Amen. he told the people not to eat or drink and he also said that it shouldn't just be mankind, but also the beasts, their animals were also proclaimed, or it was also declared that they should not eat or drink. So to avert judgment is another reason why um, we see fasting in the Bible as well. Um, intercession is another reason. In 2 Samuel 12, King David, um, in reference to the baby that he'd had with Bathsheba, Nathan had pronounced judgment and said that, you know, that the child is going to die. And so David fasted to intercede for the sickness of the child. And then also in Psalm 35, 13, he also references um, fasting and humbling himself for those who are sick. Um, if you're seeking direction and making important plans, we see that in Acts 13, verses two to three, when Paul and Barnabas were set apart for ministry. And so they fasted and they laid hands on them and then they sent them forth to, to evangelize. And then just to become more spiritually receptive, um, Ellen White gives us a quote or gives us a statement in letter 73. So if someone can read that. For certain things, fasting and prayer are recommended and appropriate. In the hand of God, they are meant 
are, are a means of cleansing the heart and promoting a receptive frame of mind. Thank you. Okay. So it helps us to become more spiritually receptive. And I'll actually talk about um, one of the reasons for that a little bit later. Um, in 2 Samuel 1, we see that the people, the Israelites mourned because of the loss of King Saul and Jonathan in battle. And then lastly, for guidance and protection, when Ezra and the other Israelites left Babylon, left the captivity, he proclaimed a fast while they were in transit um, for guidance and for protection. Mm. So these are just a, a few different types of fasts that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's many more, but these are just a few different types of fasts. So the Daniel fast is kind of a popular one. I've, I've heard of it um, years ago, and it was something that I did myself. Um, it's, it's pretty much just simplifying your diet um, to food that is, you know, based on what Daniel says in, in chapter 10, verse three, things that just, it's, it's just a lot more simple. So people who may not be religiously inclined may actually participate in that fast. Um, it requires no alcohol <laughs> consumption. Um, he says no pleasant bread. So he just simplified his diet while he combined that with praying. Um, there's also intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting is, even though Ellen White doesn't actually use the terminology, it's actually the type of fast that she, um, that she engaged in or she practiced in her household. So in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4A, she actually cites that they had breakfast at 7 a.m. and supper at 1 p.m. So that means that they had a six-hour gap between their first meal and their last meal. And then the remainder of that time from 1 p.m. to 7 a.m. the following morning was a fast. So intermittent fasting is where you have a period of time where you eat. And then outside of that window, you're not eating and you're just fasting. And I know one of the popular, um, I guess, models is like the 16-8 method. So you'll fast for 16 hours and then you'll feed for eight hours. And some people will eat very freely throughout that eight hours. So if they eat at eight o'clock and their last meal is at four, they might eat again at 10 and might eat again at, at noon and again at one. That's not recommended to snack between meals, but intermittent fasting where you eat, um, you separate your meals, anywhere between four to six hours, um, maybe about five hours, just as a happy medium. Intermittent fasting is something that is practiced and is something that, you know, apparently has a lot of health benefits as well. Um, water fast, I think that's probably the most common type of fast that we see when people refer to as fasting. There's juice fasting and a lot of people, um, I guess like they swear by it. They say that they're able to lose weight and they feel so much more clear headed. Um, they'll just drink like a lot of natural juice and they'll combine certain fruits or vegetables that are supposed to have a, a very um, positive effect when you combine them for your health. And Ellen White actually talks about a fruit fast. And she says in Ministry of Healing, a fruit diet for a few days has often brought great relief to brain workers. So people who are engaged in more, um, maybe their job, their work is more sedentary and they are engage in a lot of work that requires the mind and the intellect, she says that um, a fruit fast can be of benefit to them. And then we have the more extreme fast of complete abstinence from food and water. So that is declared in Esther 4.16 and Jonah 3.5. So those were when um, judgment was pronounced. So um, the king of Medo-Persia had pronounced through a declaration that all the Jews would be destroyed. And so Esther, when she found out, Queen Esther, she asked all of the people to fast for three days and she herself even included and said, I'm gonna fast as well along with my maidens. And she said, no food and no water. And then that's the same type of fast that the king of Nineveh also proclaimed in Jonah three. Mm -hmm. And then Moses's fast was more supernatural because he was locked into the presence of God. So we see that reference in Exodus 24, 18 and Deuteronomy 9, 9, where he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. But again, it was supernatural because he was in the presence of God. So it wasn't something that um, required him to do maybe any additional effort on his part, like a, a regular fast would as far as the, um, you know, just 
the, the, the mental anguish that you might feel from not eating. So Moses was locked in with God. So it was not the same per se as the other fast that was declared in Esther and Jonah. And then there's a marital fast that Paul talks about in first Corinthians seven, five. And he says, defraud ye not one, the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And then the last one, and again, this is not exhaustive. This is just a, a compilation of a few different ones would be fasting from like electronics or social media. So those are more modern fasts that, um, you know, obviously with modern technology, um, we have almost some people have almost abused it. And so a lot of people might feel compelled to limit their time on social media or electronics, or even just abstain from it for a period of time so that when they come back to it, they're using it more moderately and more appropriately. So that's something that's more modern. That's obviously not seen in the Bible, but it's a type of fast that some people choose to engage in as well. So the spiritual benefits of fasting. So one of the spiritual benefits of fasting is just learning to exercise self-control of the spirit over the flesh. So I don't have the scriptures up on the screen, but if someone can read um, Romans 8, 6 to 8, <clears throat> so that helps to give us a little bit more context of the, um, of the, the benefit. Romans 8. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Right? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay. So... That right there just shows that, you know, the spirit, there's a constant battle between the spirit and the flesh. And when we're learning, um, when we're fasting and we're exercising that control over the flesh, it helps us learn to say no to what's good. Food is good for us. You know, food sustains us. And when we're saying no to the flesh for something that's good, then it helps us to be able to say no to the things that are bad. So when we're tempted, we have built up um, through the grace of God that willpower and that ability to say no and to exercise control over the over the flesh instead of allowing the flesh to be what rules you. And I'm going to read um, Galatians 5.17. It says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. That just helps to give us a full picture of the war that we're facing in the flesh. Um, spiritual benefits. Another spiritual benefit is that fast, fasting clears the mind for scriptural study. So again, just to have a deeper understanding of what's being read, um, a deeper understanding of how it applies to your life, we can engage in fasting and ask for wisdom for God to give us that discernment and give us that understanding. It opens our heart to be more sensitive to God's voice and it gives power to our prayers as well. It fosters humility, according to Psalm 35, 13, and it allows us um, more time for Bible study and prayer. Amen. And um, I just want to draw on my personal experience. And if anyone has experience, you know, any personal experiences, then feel free to share as well. Um, I can say for myself, point three is very true, um, that it opens our heart to be more sensitive to God's voice. Um, I would say within like the past week, two weeks, I was praying about fasting and praying about um, another job. I've been wanting to go into a different career. And I've just never I didn't feel I didn't hear God talking to me. It's been something I've been praying about long, you know, for a while. And I just didn't hear God really telling me what to do. And I didn't want to take the time to apply for another job because of the time that all of that takes to apply to interview. I didn't want to do that if God's will was not for me to change jobs. And so I asked God, you know, should I take the time to put out job applications and to, to look for something else? And while I was fasting and praying, I just felt very impressed by the Holy Spirit that the answer was no, not to continue, not to look for another job, not to take the time to do that. And 
I felt very impressed that, you know, I felt in, at peace in the sense that I had the answer to my prayer. It wasn't the answer that I wanted, to be honest, but I felt at peace that God had answered that, that prayer. And in the course of um, praying and fasting specifically about that, I stopped praying about a new job and asking God if that's what he wanted for me. And I started to pray that God would just give me peace at the job that I'm currently at. And so I felt like because I was in that, um, in that space where I was fasting and I was praying, I was truly more sensitive to God's voice and God's impression that, you know, the answer to my prayer was no, but instead of just no, it was, I want you to pray for peace. I want you to pray that you'll be a blessing to those who are, who are, who you, who you encounter at your job. So in that moment, I, I pretty much switched my prayer so that I was still praying about work, but I was praying more about being a, a benefit to those there and having peace while I was at work as well. And the last point, um, it gives us more time for Bible study and prayer. It's amazing how much time we spend in like preparing food and eating, and you don't even realize it until you're actually fasting. Like I fasted this past week, um, I think it was maybe like Tuesday to Wednesday or so. And it's, it was almost such a relief not to have to worry about warming up my breakfast and then washing up the dishes and then preparing my lunch for work. So it is, it does actually free up our time for more Bible study and prayer. It may not be that we gain, you know, two extra hours or anything like that, but it actually does allow us to have more time. And then on my lunch breaks, on the days that I'm fasting, instead of eating lunch, I have more time to actually study the Bible and, or read the Bible and pray on my lunch break. And the second to last point about fostering humility is very true because it helps us to see as humans how frail we are because we're so dependent on food for our sustenance and we're so dependent on something that seems almost so trivial, but it's so important to our well-being at the same time. And sometimes if someone misses a meal, if they don't, they didn't eat breakfast or something like that, they're, they're miserable at work. So it shows us that you know, the very thing that we're so dependent on to give us sustenance, you know, it really just humbles us to see that we truly are like, but dust as what the Bible says, we truly are, you know, created beings where we're not, um, you know, sometimes we tend to exalt ourselves and think of mankind as this, you know, this race or this society that has progressed so much, but it helps us to really see our humanity when we fast and we realize how dependent we are on food. And we, we actually learned the lesson that what we're really dependent on is God. Not food. Amen. And that's how he keeps us alive. Even when we don't eat. Uh, it, Amen. Fasting is, is a, a way for <clears throat> us to have a constant reminder of our dependence on God. Amen. A Amen. Exactly. So does anyone else have um, any personal testimonies that they feel impressed to share about the spiritual benefits they've experienced with fasting? Well, the first time I ever fasted, I didn't want to fast, but uh, it was when I first became a, a Christian called a five-day plan. I'll be talking about that later. But anyway, I fasted three days with uh, colonics, and uh, then I... I I had uh, just, let me see, it was red clover, drank about a gallon and a half, two gallons a day, and then it gradually got back into fruits and vegetables. And uh, I tell you, I could think a lot clearer. <laughs> and every, every, every test I ever took when I became a, a Christian, especially when I became a physical therapist, I always fasted that whole day, and then maybe the day before and that day. Uh, and I did very well. So praise the Lord for that. I just telling you that fasting makes your head clear mm -hmm. yeah it really does and i want to share um a a sermon by doug bachelor titled when you fast and it's it's you know very biblically based he gives a lot of the spiritual <laughs> benefits of fasting and i really appreciate that sermon it's not too long but it's something that it just it's it's almost very um very simple very easy to understand about fasting and its importance and the benefits so um, when you when you get the slides um you should be able to click the link 
in the in the slide and go straight to that sermon. And it's something that I definitely recommend to understand more about the spiritual benefits of fasting. Mm. So the health benefits of fasting, um, and a lot of these are found in the spirit of prophecy. Um, so it helps us to develop an appetite for plain food. And I would say that for myself, um, it's helped me to become more temperate and it's helped me to resist certain things that in the past, it was a lot more challenging for me to resist and even to appreciate um, more plain food. I was um, very much hooked on sweets. Like I've always liked sweets. And so I'm having more of a, a relish or a preference for the natural sweets. So fruits like banana and mango and dates, like those, those are natural um, sweet fruits. And of course we should exercise temperance when we're eating them, but just eating them in and of themselves actually give me the, the, the craving, I guess you could say for sweets is fulfilled just by eating them. So I don't need to go out and buy donuts or anything like that. So Ellen White does counsel us to have, um, you know, a more of a simple diet. And so eating those things or fasting can help us to appreciate having um, more plain food as part of our diet. It actually helps to conquer disease. So I know that at certain health institutes, certain Adventist health institutes and sanitariums, they'll actually recommend those who are um, who have come seeking treatment to fast. So they might recommend like a three-day fast. Um, it increases willpower, and that's something that we already discussed as far as saying no to the flesh and, and saying yes to the spirit. And a lot of these other points are discussed in the sermon that I have linked below by Eric Walsh titled The Power of Fasting. And his church at the time that he preached this was doing um, a, like a series on the health message. And so he discussed temperance. And a lot of people actually wanted to know more about temperance and more about fasting. And so he did like a part two to temperance titled The Power of Fasting. So it's like a supplement. And it's only about 20 minutes. It's not as long as the other sermons that he preaches, but I think it's very powerful. And because he's a medical doctor, he has a lot of the medical understanding and um, yeah, the medical understanding as far as the benefits of fasting. So he goes into more of like something that a layman can understand regarding um, the medical aspect of fasting or the health benefits, but he goes into those details to help you understand more of the health benefits of fasting. So it restructures the brain and allows it to heal. Um, it reverses insulin resistance and decreases leptin resistance, and that helps you to feel full. So instead of um, being at a point where you don't, your leptin resistance is so high, you're not able to feel satisfied, you're not able to feel full. And so it decreases that. So you are able to feel full and feel satisfied sooner and not be compelled to overeat. It fights inflammation. And it also boosts cognitive function by allowing the brain to rest between meals. So does anyone have any anything that they've noticed when they fasted as far as like any health benefits that they want to share? I think it's one I of the reasons. It. Oh, what were you saying? Sorry. Um, I was just going to say uh, every time I got bronchitis, it was cleared up when I fasted. Wow, that's impressive. Mm. Whoa. I know bronchitis is pretty serious, so that's amazing. Well, Felipe and I saw a um, a video called "The Science of Fasting" and giving you the health benefits of fasting, and uh, you know, that's what Lisa's referring to. She was getting bronchitis probably every month, and when we went wow. through the fasting program. Uh, she had no bronchitis except for one incident in the last three years. Mm -hmm. So wow. it's had a tremendous benefit for her. Wow. Well, praise God. You can find that on YouTube. The science of fasting is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Okay. So in I the Bible. The benefit of, of clearer thinking, Mike. Right? Say it again. Mm -hmm. Clear your mind. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, I, I said that I, I, I've experienced having much clearer thinking, both mm -hmm. no matter what I'm thinking about, but also especially in most spiritual things. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, I think that sounds to be like a common theme. Like the, it really does clear, like allow your mind to have more, um, 
you know, to be clear. And I think that part of that, I guess, scientifically is because when we eat, our bodies have to expend the energy to, or the energy has to go to the stomach to aid in the process of digestion. And when we're not eating, you know, our brain is able to get more of the blood. And if we're eating, you know, properly and we have good blood, um, you know, our brain is able to be nourished and we're not, you know, we're able to think more clearly than if we're eating and the, the process of digestion has to be fostered. It's, a, it's also the case uh, when we fast, you, your body shifts its metabolism to something called ketosis. And it, when it burns fat instead of glucose, it, it's using uh, ketones for energy that it gets out of the fat. And those ketones can cross the blood brain barrier much more easily. So you get a lot of energy to your brain too. Wow, that's amazing. So I'm going to read um, Isaiah 58, three to seven. I'm not going to actually read the whole thing, but it's just to summarize, this is when um, the people were being, you know, were, were basically saying, you know, we fasted and God, you're not seeing that, you're not acknowledging that. And we've, we're afflicting ourselves and it's like, you don't even notice. And so God, in response to that, he is basically rebuking them for their fasting. It's like they're fasting, but it's not true heart repentance. There's, they're still sinning in a sense. It says that in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. And when I looked further at that verse, it was saying that they were still exploiting their laborers. Um, it, it was not really a time where they were putting away wrongs and, and making themselves right between themselves with between themselves as a people and God. And mm. he's, he says further down that, you know, is, is it such a fast that I have chosen? And he says the things that he would like them to do. So to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free, to give food to the hungry, to bring the poor into your home and to clothe the naked. So it's not just about the physical aspect of, you know, of abstaining from food. If our hearts are not right, and if we're not taking the time to understand the will of God and how he wants us to treat other people and how he wants us to relate to them as well. And here are some spirit of prophecy quotes about um, more about like the true fasting. And Ellen White says that the true fasting that should be recommended to all is abstinence from every stimulating kind of food. So she promotes a simple diet, not something that is, um, you know, overstimulating or hard to digest, or it doesn't, it doesn't contribute to health. And I'm gonna, if someone can read the last quote from the Review and Herald. Review and Herald. Well, now and onward till the close of time, the people of God should be more earnest, more wide awake, not trusting in their own wisdom, but in the wisdom of their leader. They should set aside days for fasting and prayer. Entire abstinence from food may not be required, but they should eat sparingly of the most simple food. Thank you. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. So like she says, we don't necessarily have to abstain from food um, during certain periods where we fast. We don't have to abstain completely, but we can have a more simple diet. We can have just fruits or vegetables for the day and not have a diet that is more necessarily complex because we understand that that food still brings us a lot of um, health benefits, just eating even the simpler foods that are what God provided for us in abundance. And in the sermon by Doug Batchelor that I cited earlier, he actually says that the early reformers, the early Protestant reformers, like I believe Martin Luther, he quoted, and I believe he said Tyndale, and there were a couple others, that when they were undergoing the process of translating the Bible, they did not, um, I think they had much simpler diets on the, you know, during the time that they were doing that, because I'm sure it was very sedentary, they were probably sitting for long periods of time but they also needed clear minds in order to translate the text properly. So that was also something that I found interesting. And it just echoes what everyone else has been saying that their minds were a lot clearer during their, their periods of fasting. What I read in my research was that if they had not have fasted uh, during that period of time, there wouldn't have been a reformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that Amen. makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah, Amen. they have clearer minds to hear from God and to to do his work and to know what direction to go in. So that makes a lot of sense. Amen. Um, and then another another topic I think that's been um, somewhat controversial within the Adventist community is what day for fasting? Because we know that for us, um, the Sabbath is a day that's set apart. It's sanctified. Um, we're not doing any work. We're not, you know, we're not engaging in, in manual labor. Um, anything obviously that's not for the preservation of life, you know, or any type of emergency situation, you know, we abstain from, from working and from, from like our, our typical nine to five job, so to speak. And so some people are of the position that fasting on Sabbath is what we should be doing, um, because they have, they have more time to spend in communion with God and communion and, and fellowship with their, their church brethren. And then other people say that because the Sabbath should be a joyous occasion, it's a commemoration of God's creative power, that we shouldn't be fasting on the Sabbath because it's going to turn it into a day of, um, a day of, of sorrow and, and make it burdensome. So I just have some quotes from um, Ellen White, and I'm not necessarily going to go through all of them, but in the first one, she does cite that they fasted on a Sabbath and specifically um, they were, she was, she was given a vision about slavery. And so they had fasted on the Sabbath in this specific instance, and they were blessed in the sense that she had been given a vision during this time that they had set aside for fasting. Um, in manuscript releases, she says that the Sabbath, that specific Sabbath was set apart for fasting and prayer and a becoming solemnity rested upon all. And then there's three other quotes. And she says in the first one that people would receive a, a blessing in abstaining from or dispensing with one meal of the day. Um, so that you can have more time for testimony meeting. So I guess what she would, what we would call prayer meeting. Um, and then she said, we used often to make the Sabbath a day of fasting and prayer, and we were greatly blessed in our worship. And in the last quote from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, she says that we should actually not provide for the Sabbath a more liberal supply or greater supply of food than for other days. So oftentimes, you know, different churches will have potluck and there'll be like a, a very um, a wide variety of food that's available for consumption. And it's counsel that instead of having a more liberal supply of food, she actually says that the food should be more simple and less should be eaten. And the reason she says this is so that our minds can be clearer and more vigorous to comprehend spiritual things. And when we overeat, it affects our brain so that we're not able to hear and appreciate the things that are being spoken from the pulpit. So I know that there's times um, where you might overeat at church, and I'm not saying um, anyone specifically, but even just myself, you might overeat at church and then you go home and you have to take a nap. So mm -hmm. instead of, you know, the Sabbath being a blessing because you're going home and you're spending time you know, in communion with God in prayer and um, meditating on the condition of your heart, you have to go and, and go to sleep because your body has to use so much energy to digest the food that you've consumed that you can't even stay awake. And so in that sense, the Sabbath, it loses um, some of the blessing, I guess, or you, you're not able to, to fully experience all of the blessing that is there in the Sabbath because of the overeating that takes place. So it's really a personal decision for everyone to decide if they should or shouldn't fast on the Sabbath. But I know for me, because I work Monday to Friday and then Sunday, I'm often catching up on things that I have, I haven't been able to do in the week. Um, fasting on the Sabbath has been a blessing for me because I'm able to use that time where I'm not working. I'm not worried about doing laundry and stuff in order to spend more time with God. Amen. Um, Amen. An interesting article that I came across today was that uh, the church, the global church, has four days of um, fasting and prayer. Uh, and the article that I read was the 2021, but it said that uh, April 3rd was the day that um, they selected for that particular year. April 3rd, okay. For, uh, okay, 2021, okay. Yeah. Wow. So practical tips for fasting, and I know we're kind of running long time, so I'm going to go through these um, somewhat quickly. 
But practical tips for fasting um, would just be to ask God to give you the strength to abstain from food. So first of all, prayer, if you're struggling with fasting or starting to fast, you know, ask God, that's the first thing that we should do instead of trying to do it in our own strength, start mm -hmm. slow. So there's a couple of different ways that you can start slow. If you have three meals a day, maybe you can drop it down to two. Um, you might want to just try having a simpler meal for one of your meals and then maybe progress to having two very simple meals for the day. So there's a, a, a couple of different combinations that you can try as far as how to wean yourself into fasting. Um, these are also tips that I try to use for myself. So this is more, um, I guess you could say anecdotal, um, you know, experience that I I've compiled. So I try to limit my time around food when I'm fasting. So I try not to go, go in the fridge too much. Um, I definitely don't use that as my day to go grocery shopping. If I'm working that day, I try not to go into the break room because, you know, people are typically eating in there. They've brought food. Um, if you are responsible for the nutritional needs of someone else in your home, obviously it depends on how long you're fasting and that person's needs as well. But if you can have the meal already prepared ahead of time so that you're not taking the time to have to cook the food, um, that can be something that can help you as well. And exercising and fasting is okay, but it may be challenging, especially if you're just starting out. Um, and then practical tips for fasting. Um, choose a day where you have more time and opportunity available for prayer and Bible study and meditation. Like I said, for me, the Sabbath, I have more time available to me. Um, Monday to Friday, it's like the majority of my waking hours seem to be comprised of work. So when I'm fasting, I'm not able to really combine that too much with prayer and meditation of the scriptures. So choose a day where you have more time and opportunity for that. Plan what you're fasting and praying about. So don't just jump into it and say, okay, I'm going to fast. And then you have no idea what you're actually fasting and praying about. Um, I like to have scriptures and spirit of prophecy references relating to what I'm fasting about just already available and planned out. Of course, we should allow the Holy Spirit to impress upon us um, certain things, but it's nice to still have a starting point. So if I'm fasting about health, there's certain scriptures that I might um, have ready so that I can claim those promises as well. Um, set aside designated times for prayer and Bible study. So if you're fasting about four things, you might want to set aside specific times. So maybe 6 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and then 6 p.m. So have those specific times set aside. I found that when I'm fasting and praying and I don't have that kind of structure, especially when I'm doing different things around the home, I find that it's so much easier to neglect the time for prayer because I have not actually set aside those specific hours and time for fasting and praying. And then minimize your distractions. So consider eliminating social media, anything that's going to upset you, anything that's going to take your mind away from the spiritual channel that you would like it to be in. Um, and then when it comes to breaking your fast, first thing, of course, to do would be to pray, you know, thanking God for the opportunity to petition him, the promises in the Bible, thanking him for the answers, even though you may not even see a manifestation of those answers already. Um, consider introducing simple plant-based foods to your stomach. A lot of the sources I consulted, um, I didn't really see anything in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy about what to eat to break your fast, but I think that all depends on your constitution as a person. I think for me, my stomach is a little stronger, so I may be able to eat certain things to break my fast that other people might struggle with. But when I do break my fast, I try to have something simple and plant-based that I'm introducing back into my stomach. Some some sources said to have raw food, like raw, raw vegetables and raw fruit. Some sources said not to have raw vegetables and to cook them. So there was a lot of conflicting information, but I think that's all kind of up to what works best for you, but it should still be something that's simple. Um, another suggestion, have the food ready to eat. The worst thing for me is when I'm breaking, I've broken my fast and then I have to figure out what am I going to eat, take the time to cook it or to prepare it. So if you have the food already prepared, then it really can help because you know that you're not um, depriving yourself, I guess, I guess you could say, um, even more. And then in Acts 919, Paul, when he had the Damascus road experience, um, when he was breaking his fast, it's found in verse 19. And it said, when he had received meat, he was strengthened. So it was clear that whatever he ate, even though we don't have the details of what it was provided strength. So we should be breaking our fast with food. That's going to be helpful and provide us with strength. And then 
I have a couple quotes about simplistic diet. And when we get, when you guys get the slides, you can read them more in detail. But the one that I want to highlight the most is that in Isaiah 33, 16, um, we understand according to Daniel and Revelation that there's going to be a time of trouble. And we know that as, in that time, um, Ellen White gives us a lot more context and details about that time. We're going to have to depend fully on God for our food. And Isaiah gives us the promise that our bread shall be given him and his water shall be sure. Mm. And some spirit of prophecy quotes about um, the end of time as it relates to food um, is that God is going to sustain us. So we have the promise that we're not having to worry about our food and our sustenance. And the last quote that I'll, I'll bring about in this, in the instance of the end time is that stern necessity will require the people of God to deny self and to eat merely enough to sustain life. But God will pre prepare for, prepare us for that time. And bread and water is all that is promised to the remnant in the time of trouble. So God, even in, um, in what he gave Ellen White, it's clear that having a simple diet is what is God's will for us and his desire for us. And when we're completely dependent on him in the time of trouble, that's what he's going to give us as well. And then the last point, if you have not made fasting a regular discipline in your life, consider praying for God to give you wisdom to know how to begin and praying that God will help you to see the additional blessings in your life and the lives of others in response to prayer and fasting. And then if you have made fasting a regular discipline in your life, consider praying that God will show you if there's anything you can improve in your fasting and prayer methodology and encouraging others to join you in prayer and fasting. So that is it. Um, I just want to, you know, thank everyone for coming. And if anyone has any final points um, for encouragement or, you know, any questions or anything, you know, I just want to briefly, I guess, allow for that time since I know where we're about to end. Actually, if yeah. you don't mind, um, I am so sorry to interject. I just got, I was texting the pastors just right now because they do have a meeting at seven o'clock. They need to start. But I was going to ask Shakira, is it okay if I share your email just with the group? That way, if they had like any questions or insight or something, is that okay if I share your email just to the group, not a public mm -hmm. email? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Because I definitely want, and guys, we can continue this conversation next week as well. But I'm so sorry because the no, church is having mm -hmm. attendees of prayer and I, they definitely want to have that available now. So I am going to have to log off. But I can speak for myself and many of you saying this is the best presentation I have ever heard on fasting and prayer. You've certainly Amen. convicted me. And if you guys don't <laughs> mind, I'm just going to pray now because I'm sure all of us have different takeaways that we want to apply to our lives. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for Shakira. And I ask that you just continue to pour your spirit out on her as she uses what you've revealed to her to help other people. And fasting, of course, is something that sometimes I um, drag my feet on. So this has certainly convicted me and I'm sure it's convicted many other people. So I ask that you just be with us. Please show us what exactly we need to fast for and what exactly we need to do. In your precious and holy name, amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Shakira. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Shakira. Good Amazing job. job. When you send out the PowerPoint, I'll just send it to everyone. Okay. Thank I'll you. send it in a moment. All right. Good night, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.